Good morning. I'm Julianne Polanco. I have the great pleasure of being California State Historic Preservation Officer and the past, immediate past co-chair of the Climate Heritage Network. Welcome to you all today. The, cultural, uh, the Climate Heritage Network, an arts, culture, and heritage organization committed to aiding our communities in tackling climate change and achieving a just, low carbon, resilient future. We're so excited to be uh, a partner in the Resiliency Hub um, and the first time that culture has been included in a global campaign. So today you're gonna hear from many of our partners and colleagues about what we're up to, what culture brings to the climate action uh, conversation and how you can join us together in making a resilient future. Thank you for being with us today. And next is Angelica Arias. She's um, coming to us from Cato, Ecuador. Over to you, Angelica. Hello, everybody. Greetings from Quito, Ecuador, in the middle of the world. I, I'm Angelica Arias, and today I am honored to speak to you as the new CHN's co-chair for Latin America and the Caribbean. I am also the executive director of the Metropolitan Institute of Heritage of Quito, which is ready uh, and set to go and win this race to resilience. How wonderful to be part of this celebration as a culture and heritage actor, as a carrier of this unique power that culture has, which is to touch and remove the deepest of human feelings. This power to communicate, to make us shiver, to heal us. We celebrate the culture, is shouting loud and is being heard. It's inviting us to use its, its potential to enhance the resilience of communities. So let's hold hands and join us in this race. We will become stronger and build resilience to preserve our cultural heritage. Now, I want to introduce you to the brand new CHN's co-chair for North America, Shannon Shee Miller. She is the director of the Office of Historic Preservation of the city of San Antonio. Um, thank you so much, Angelica and, and Julie. Um, I'm, I'm Shannon Miller. As Angelica said, I'm the director of the Office of Historic Preservation in San Antonio, Texas, the United States. I wish I was there joining you um, in Glasgow, but I'm happy to be with you um, this morning from San Antonio. Um, in 2020, the Climate Heritage Network hosted a series of Culture of Resilience events in three different regions as part of the Champions November Dialogues. Um, the purpose of the dialogue events was to create a global forum to showcase the role that arts, culture, and heritage can play in achieving climate resilience. The November Dialogues provided data, insight, ideas, and standing to launch the Race to Resilience initiative. The November, the November Dialogues also supported the inclusion of new cultural goals in the 2020 update of the Marrakesh Global Partnership for Climate Action Adaptation Pathway Action Table, which was another huge breakthrough. I want to recognize and thank the over 50 speakers that participated in our three November Dialogue um, Culture of Resilience events and the thousands of attendees that participated as well, um, without whom we couldn't have created the successful Race to Resilience initiative. Um, to talk more about the initiative, we have Andrew Potts, who's the Climate Heritage Network coordinator, and he's going to tell us more. Hello, all, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Andrew Potts, and I'm the coordinator of the Climate Heritage Network Secretariat. It's my uh, huge pleasure and honor to be here, uh, to be with the audience we have here today in the Resilience Hub in the Blue Zone at COP26, and to be with friends and colleagues around the world virtually. Uh, I've been asked to give you a sort of proper introduction to the culture initiative within the Race to Resilience campaign. What is the Race to Resilience and what are the goals of the culture initiative? But before that, uh, maybe just to say a little bit about this venue that we're in, the Resilience Hub. So many of you will know that adaptation and resilience, it's a, a, of course a global priority, it's also a specific priority of this COP26. The Resilience Hub, where we are today, is uh, a key venue in the COP uh, conversation about 
resilience. So that's extraordinary in and of itself, that there's this dedicated venue for resilience at COP26. But uh, even more extraordinary, to my way of thinking, is that culture has been invited into the resilience hub. The hub has 10 themes, and one of them is culture. So this is really a breakthrough recognition of the role of culture in adaptation and resilience. This event we're having in the moment is one of the very first uh, culture theme events in the Resilience Hub, but it is certainly not the last. It's one of many. And so I invite you, encourage you to Google uh, COP26 Resilience Hub and find the culture theme events going on over the next two weeks. Uh, after today, the next event in our theme is another extraordinary one called the Uncertain Four Seasons. It's a distorted production of Vivaldi's Four Seasons that illustrates the different ways that people around the world will experience the climate crisis and also the power of culture and in particular music to um, communicate about the urgency of climate change. So please follow us uh, all two weeks here in the culture theme of the Resilience uh, Hub. So now to the topic at hand, the race to resilience and culture. So what is the Race to Resilience? The Race to Resilience is a global campaign that aims to catalyze a step change in the global ambition for climate resilience, putting people and nature first in pursuit of a resilient world where we don't just survive climate shocks and stresses, but thrive in spite of them. The campaign now has 24 partner initiatives and the Climate Heritage Network and our members around the world were thrilled to learn that we had been included as one of these 24. Uh, we learned that back in September. Collectively, the 24 initiatives make up over 2,500 non-state actors taking action over 100 countries across the world on the themes, uh, on the campaign's themes of urban, rural, and coastal resilience. Lastly, what have we committed to? What, what is our vision of the culture initiative within the Race to Resilience? Well, one of the requirements of the race is that the members have to uh, commit to targets, numerical targets even. Um, how many vulnerable people will we aim to help through our uh, work? The culture initiative within the Race to Resilience has committed to assisting 200 million people by 2030 from vulnerable groups and communities across the world, helping them to be made more resilient through culture-based strategies. How? Our aim is to find at least 200 cities and regions across the world that will commit to continuing, expanding, or adding culture-based strategies for making people more resilient by 2030. And lastly, what do I mean when I say cities and regions? It could be government, yes, but it doesn't have to be. We're talking about networks of cultural actors and operators in territories around the world. Could be institutions like museums and libraries, could be local community groups, could be NGOs, could be local government, all non-state actors. We hope to find clusters of non-state actors in at least 200 cities and regions around the world who will commit to scaling up culture-based resilience strategies. And so that is the culture initiative within the Race to Resilience that we're launching today and thrilled to be doing so. And it's been my pleasure to be with you. Uh, thank you. Back to you, Julie. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, next, we have a, a pre-recorded video uh, about the uncertain four seasons. Tim Devine, Executive Innovation Director for AKQA, the uncertain four seasons, Australia. When audiences first heard Vivaldi's Four Seasons in the 18th century, it was a sensation. It gave audiences something they'd never experienced before. It communicated more than music. It painted a scene, it told a story. It was an attempted translation of the language of nature. But the natural world that Vivaldi drew his inspiration from was about to dramatically change. The Industrial Revolution was still 150 years away, but already enclosures were taking place across Europe. Forests, rivers and rich pastures were being fenced off and privatised. Orchards and crops that allowed subsistence lifestyles were being torched to force people into labour. 
and colonisation in all its forms was plundering distant lands to build the new decadence at home. Europe was also in the midst of a scientific revolution and amongst the exciting discoveries, a new ontology was being ushered in and solidified. were increasingly seeing themselves as separate and superior to nature, and nature itself was being stripped of any remaining soul or sentience that the animist cultures had long espoused. This view suited both the church and the emerging capitalists at the time, because without meaning or value, nature was a lot easier to commodify. We must hound nature, put her in constraints, said Francis Bacon, the father of modern science. We must enter and penetrate her every hole. Bacon's aim was to transform nature from nurturing mother to what he called a common harlot. As we know too well, this mindset was soon to arrive on Australian shores, decimating a 60,000 year ontology of custodianship and reverence for the land. Vivaldi was creatively spoilt with the abundance of nature that surrounded him. Since his writing, our pursuit of endless growth and expansion has destroyed half the planet's rainforests, 68% of all animal life, and has seen a 40% increase of carbon and a 150% increase of methane in our atmosphere, rising our global temperature by 1.3 degrees. But Vivaldi's work contains a stunning lesson for our predicaments today. He articulates the human experience of the Four Seasons. The farmer who shakes his fists at the heavens as a wild storm ravishes his crops. In recent decades, the reality of our ecological threats has been approached largely through a rational scientific lens. An endless barrage of graphs, data and lifeless statistics have been used as frontline soldiers in the climate wars. But our species has evolved to tell stories, to be stirred into action by music, by art and by the liminal. Our scientists desperately need the help of artists because art disseminates the complexity, the lingo, the jargon and translates it into a language of the soul. A language that is disappearing as quickly as our forests and precious animals. What you can expect to hear in the Uncertain Four Seasons variations are new ecological possibilities. It's a collaboration between musicians, computer developers and climate scientists to take the themes and ideas from Vivaldi's original score and recompose them as if he'd written them in the year 2050. these new variations, our now warmer air holds more moisture, increasing the intensity of our storms. Our degraded lands and denuded forests have stolen the dwellings of our cohabitants, and rising seas have altered the lifestyles and festivities of all communities. 
The Uncertain Four Seasons project has rescored Vivaldi's work for every city in the world. Every variation is different, each one jarringly altered from the harmony of Vivaldi's original. Orchestras everywhere were encouraged to perform their variation in the lead up to the pivotal meeting of nations to discuss climate change at COP this year. But as you listen, know that all is not lost. Let the music help you to ponder or mourn what is gone, but also allow it to free up the space required to join the billions of people who are not accepting our current trajectory and are actively pursuing the restoration of so many of our interconnected systems. These are the humans who are rewilding landscapes, returning microbial life to the soils, deacidifying our oceans, reintroducing native species and embracing indigenous wisdom. Climate change and all of our ecological dilemmas are not scientific problems. They are human problems. It's easy to forget that we humans are a keystone species, and keystone species are capable of regenerating and defining entire ecosystems. If you listen carefully, there's a new song emerging, a new concerto is being written by a growing community that believes we can once again inhabit a world that Vivaldi so beautifully articulated 300 years ago. Apologies to our dear colleague, David Grosso, International Music Council, Paris, France. David, over to you. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm really excited uh, to be with you today, celebrating the inclusion of culture in the UN uh, New Race to Resilience campaign. That's a really uh, big step for all of us. As representative of the International Music Council, I cannot think of a better occasion uh, to reiterate our strong conviction that music is a key element in building resilience. We have all heard sentences such as when music speaks, everybody understands, or music is a universal language and so on. But going beyond the obvious, there is much more in terms of scientific, economic and social data, which brings evidence on the transformative power of music. The music ecosystem, and by extension, the culture ecosystem all together can play a pivotal role in reaching climate justice. Still, arts and culture are probably the most powerful tool to raise awareness, and art artists have to be essential of the process. And we have just seen a remarkable example. Uh, I, wa I, I was very, very excited to see uh, such a powerful project by Tim Devine, Executive Innovation Director at uh, AKQA. Uh, but mentioning just his title wouldn't be fair. Tim Devine uh, is a visionary whose purpose is to drive the development of work that meaningfully influences culture and adds to what life could be challenging what is it and provides alternatives that loosen the ties reality has on our ability to dream. So I'm very happy to be speaking after this uh, really uh, um, remarkable example of what music can be. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next, we have Navin Piplani, Indian National Trust and Arts, Culture and Heritage. Navin, over to you. Hello and greetings to all the participants from all across the globe. Uh, I am Navin Peplani of the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage uh, with a membership of about uh, 8,000 plus uh, Indian citizens and over 200 uh, chapters all across the country. Uh, and I, I just wish to, uh, uh, wish to uh, highlight how excited we are uh, to be joining and supporting the Race to Resilience Culture Heritage Initiative uh, and, and hope that we not only achieve the target, but we go beyond the target uh, and we get uh, many more stakeholders and many more communities 
uh, included uh, in this race, which we have to all win, uh, leaving no one behind. It's my huge honor and privilege today to introduce Ms. Karima Benoon, who has been uh, who has been bringing uh, the issues and concerns of the culture sector to to the UN. She's a UN special rapporteur uh, in the field of cultural heritage, uh, and she's also a visiting professor at, at the University of Michigan Law School. We need several uh, Karimas across the globe. Uh, to raise the voice, to present the concerns, uh, and and to highlight and to stress our voices uh, into all the arenas uh, where culture needs to be included and where it matters the most. So uh, I deeply welcome Ms. Karina Benoon for her address. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I send my greetings to those in Glasgow fighting for the future of humanity and to all those around the world who share the urgent concern that the efforts in Glasgow be successful. I'm truly honored to take part in this launch of the Climate Heritage Network Race to Resilience campaign during COP26. This is my first event as the former UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, my term having ended on Sunday, but my commitment is ongoing. I'm a strong supporter of the Climate Heritage Network, which is a global coalition seeking to mobilize culture and heritage actors around climate change and to bridge the gap between climate action and cultural initiative. Such efforts are especially laudable for bringing together local voices and international coordination. So taking the network's, network's efforts as my starting point, in my time, I'm going to briefly address the positive potential of culture, cultural heritage and cultural rights to enhance responses to climate change. And I think we've already seen such a beautiful example of that in the uncertain four seasons, which I will always think of now when I hear Vivaldi's work. Let me say first as the backdrop to my remarks that we must constantly remind all the governments taking part in COP26 that the climate emergency is nothing less than an existential threat to life, to human rights, and to human cultures. And it is a threat that requires the adoption of holistic human rights-based strategies to enhance climate action and meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius target, which we must meet. I thought about this in a very personal way on Sunday when I went to visit my late father's grave to mark my last day in the UN cultural rights mandate since he inspired me to work for human rights. For the first time ever, I found his gravestone submerged under water because it has rained so much this year, the ground cannot absorb more water. And in that moment, I was reminded how our pasts as well as our futures and all we hold most dear culture uh, to rectify this situation. Because culture and cultural rights are prime casualties in the climate emergency, but they're also vital tools in our struggle to respond to it. They enable us to make better policy choices. They offer a critical set of tools for implementing climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies. They are vital for enabling the society, societal transformation called for by the IPCC to meet the 1.5 degree target. The panel defines resilience as the ability of a social or ecological system to absorb disturbances while retaining the same basic structure and ways of functioning, the capacity of self-organization and the capacity to adapt to stress and change. The exercise of cultural rights in accordance with international standards is absolutely necessary to achieve such resilience in the face of climate change vulnerabilities. Resilience is ingrained in many aspects of cultural life and in artistic and cultural practice. Culture allows us to reimagine the world as the United Cities and Local Governments Culture 21 Actions Report tells us. Moreover, culture also helps determine how people respond to adaptation. So cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, and creativity are climate assets and should be recognized as such. Arts, 
culture and heritage are sources of creativity and inspiration that can help shape the, adapt the acceptability of policy or system change. And we must think broadly about the relationship between culture and addressing climate change, including through cultural change, including through thinking about our ways of interacting with nature and rethinking those ways, and including through the promotion of green cultures. Such efforts require the marshalling of cultural resources. According to UNESCO, healthy world heritage sites can contribute considerably to healthy landscapes and seascapes that are better able to buffer climate change impacts. And it's wonderful to see that in some countries, cultural heritage is increasingly being incorporated into responses to climate change. Arts and culture are also critical fields for the mobilization of climate action, as well as for information sharing and awareness raising. Let me conclude by saying that culture and cultural rights have inherent value for human beings and for their enjoyment of many other human rights. However, we must now also recognize their tremendous utility in our existential fight against catastrophic climate change. This means that all environmental standards and policies should take the cultural dimension into consideration. And this also means that we have yet one more reason to take cultures seriously. Without them, we are at even greater risk in our warming world. May this message be heard loud and clear in Glasgow at COP26 and beyond. It is now my honor to introduce two vignette speakers who will provide personal reflections on the possibilities of culture-based strategies to address resilience. They are first, Johannes Widodo, Director, International Network of Tropical Architecture in Singapore, who will address the diversity of knowledge systems and livelihoods. And secondly, Queen Quet, Chiefess of the Gula Gichi Nation, who will address equity and justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karima. Uh, greetings from the tropical island of Singapore. The multitude crisis that we face today, including global warming, environmental problems, and social economic issues, are related to climate crisis. They are directly caused by erratic human behavior and unethical practices. These, among others, are what's happening to our shared home planet now. Pollutions and waste caused by the throwaway culture scarcity and unequal access to clean water, encroachment of natural reserves and irreversible loss of biodiversity, deterioration of human wellness and health situations, including our current COVID pandemic, socioeconomic polarity, economic greed, and the need of social justice. And we have more frequent and severe natural and human-made disaster, etc. We need to address those problems with necessary behavioral change, starting from self-reflections and humility. Ethically, we need to abandon unsustainable practices and depend from unsustainable and arrogant lifestyles. We have to refrain from taking what we want, but train ourselves to get just enough for what we need. We must change from consumptive behavior to a productive mindset, from destroying to caring, it is imperative to reinvent good tradition and wisdom, adopt a better lifestyle, promoting dialogue, inclusiveness, transparency, social justice, love, and care towards nature and other human beings. That is the way to go. Ethics and empathy are the essence and the most important aspect of education, especially for our children will inherit this planet home. Education is essential to prepare the next generation for social justice, social responsibility, environmental sustainability, and human wellness to heal our planet Earth. Education's concern is not just about cognitive and psychomotoric, but most importantly, values, ethics, and empathy. In November 2020, in the global online event, A Culture of Resilience, Mobilizing Arts, Culture, and Heritage to Win the Race to Zero in Asia Pacific Region, organized by the Climate Heritage Network. I talk about cultural DNA and climate resilience and Asian perspectives. 
I highlighted the strength of the sustainable intangible culture that is manifested in the tangible material cultural heritage. I use the example of Japanese culture. They can survive in the coldest winter in the wooden house with a thin paper walls, enjoying traditional hot pot and warm sake, wearing thick kimonos, sitting around a kotatsu. A kotatsu is a low wooden table frame covered by heavy blankets. Underneath is a charcoal or electric heat source, often built into the table itself. They chill down wearing thin cotton yukata in the hot summer, eating cold dishes and kakigori or shaved ice dessert flavored with syrup. A furin, a metal or glass wind chimes hung on the window on the hot summer days can induce the feeling of coolness through sound. I also cited another examples about the different attitudes against natural disasters, such as hurricanes, earthquakes, or floodings, concerning resilience and survivability, or what I call the cultural DNA. The mindset that guides the attitude of resisting nature, such as building the strongest and tallest dams around the city or investing in very strong and expensive structures that can resist the strongest wind or earthquake is not sustainable, since human cannot conquer nature power. The cultural traditions and mindset of people in seasonal flooding areas, such as in Cambodia, Vietnam, and Thailand, for example, has been teaching them to accept the power of nature. They took the boat to go to the flooded but remain open market or kids are having fun playing in the flood water during the big deluge after the heaviest rain in 20 years in Bangkok in 2011. In the Thai language, the word sanuk means to have a good time, have fun, enjoy oneself, and derive pleasure and joy from something. It is almost a rule of living for Thai people that it has to be sanuk, whatever they do. Those are some examples of the cultural DNA needed for the climate resilience. To invoke it, we need to preserve the tradition and nurture the local wisdom. I have a simple pledge to promote ethics and empathy through education. I firmly believe that the intangible value is permanent, but the tangible materiality is only temporary. What I want to do is to help to improve climate resilience, heal our common home, and achieve a sustainable future together with you all. Thank you. Stay in the field. Oh, stay in the field. Stay in the field. Until the war is ended. Right here where I be. In this year, in the sea. This year, the girl get you near and thing like that. Well, honey, what a yeti with a crack with teeth soul. Honey, what a yeti is your spiritual coming from his soul and thing like that. And what we call the Boshav and the Russia. So in Jacksonville, North Skaka, like in the Jacksonville, Florida, of the course of the United States. Honey, what a yeti this year. And right in that Boshav, when all of we suggest so us. Seem like just us, you see. And so when we enter the world with the Western people, especially those of the United States, and we hear the word justice, for people of African descent in North America, that sounds to us like just us, because it often feels like it's just us fighting to hold on to ourselves, fighting to hold on to our communities, fighting to hold on to our cultural heritage, like that of the Gullah Geechee Nation, of which I'm the head of state here on the Sea Islands from Jacksonville, North Carolina to Jacksonville, Florida. I literally live on the front shoreline of what people call climate change. And there appears to be such warring words like fighting climate and the combat against climate change that I started thinking about how much that is the war and then someone said to me, right, and when you put people on the front line, what do you do? I said, those are the ones you sacrifice. And so here it is that there are others 
who instead of allowing us to be sacrificed, decided that no, let us gather the cultural heritage communities around the world, around the global coastline. And instead of it just being just us there, let's truly look at justice and equity. And in the United States, they keep talking about Jedi principles, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, which then is reminiscent of another war, Star Wars. But we want the force to be with us that says that we can change this, that there are Anthropocene causes, that this is an anthropogenic issue. Therefore, all human beings can join in the fight against climate change. But we need not just body it down in scientific language, and as I call it, techno-speak, and I'm a computer scientist and mathematician, but instead, in basic everyday actions that every cultural community that is indigenous somewhere has been hollering and screaming from that wilderness where we even shout and we sing that we write you, Yeti we, you need to hear us so that it's not just us speaking if we're going to instead of saying the climate is changing, let's change the climate. So I decided to go into the Western world deeper and I adorned my spectacles so I could see clearly what is it that Western folks mean when they speak English and they use these words. And I looked at the word equity because when I heard equity and justice, I immediately thought of environmental justice as they define it in the United States. EJ is environmental justice instead of a just and equitable environment. So I said, well, let me just double check with what is equity to them. And they said the value of a mortgage property after deductions of charges against it or the quality of being fair and impartial there was nothing fair or impartial about the kidnap and capture of my ancestors who were from the motherland Al Kebulan that you call Africa today. They were then valued as chattel, as property. They were used as mortgage and exchange and gifts to others. And now people are slowly realizing that those of us who are their descendants are truly a gift to the world if they would realize that we still live in the traditional ways, harvesting from the land and the water, mitigating any harm against the environment by living in balance with it in a way that allows things to be fair, not just for this generation, but the next generation, taking only enough for today to literally subsist and sustain yourself, but then leaving enough to sustain the next generation. So I thought about that and said, well, isn't that what justice is? And I looked at it and it said, yes, just behavior or treatment, the quality of being fair or reasonable. And it also said the administration of law or authority to maintain this. So being one of the leaders of the Climate Heritage Network and being a co-coordinator for our working group too that focuses on how we can use cultural heritage and center it within everything that we do as we are in this battle to get the world to hear the indigenous communities and know that our knowledge, our culture, our heritage, our existence is about balance and living in it. That we had to network with others around the world that also realize that this is the time that we have the opportunity to do the just thing, to be equitable and fair for the next generation. And the way you do it is by involving every cultural community in the circle, like we gather here as we sing our spirituals and we shout in the wilderness of the Gullah Geechee Nation. And one of those spirituals became a civil rights movement song that continues to resonate from this shoreline to you. I know the one thing we did right was the day we started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. Hold on to your culture. Hold on to your heritage. 
hold on to your land, hold on to your human rights, share them with the rest of the world and let them ripple out to every shore and let us all gather in the circle, united together, and we will win the climate war and leave more for the next generation for sure. Thank you, Chief Desquinquet. We next have Dr. Albino DiPello, Head of Programs, Africa World Heritage Fund, South Africa. Over to you, Albino. Uh, thank you, Julie, and um, I'm still mesmerized by the powerful words from the Queen. Um, and I greet you all from the cradle of humankind. Um, my name is Albino Jopela. I'm the head of programs at the Africa World Heritage Fund and also the co-chair of the Climate Heritage Network for Africa and the Middle East. And I'm truly honored uh, to be here uh, with you um, today and also to be introducing our next speaker, uh, Mr. Chance uh, Kokenhauer, uh, who is the head of uh, preservation at Google Arts and Culture. So Chance leads a global partnership and projects employing new technology for 3D documentation, education and public dissemination. Recent partnerships include um, uh, institutions uh, such as UNESCO, e-commerce, British Museum, uh, World Monuments Fund, American Research Center of Egypt, Brazil National um, Museum, among others. Uh, Chance is also um, leading uh, the development of open source uh, machine learning experiments to help promote, explore and share ancient contemporary languages. For instance, Fabricius offers an interactive way for anyone to learn, play and work with Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs. And uh, Waluru um, is a new tool for exploring indigenous language uh, from around uh, the world. Before joining Google Arts and Culture, Chance co-founded um, Recreate, which is a crowdsourcing project uh, for lots of heritage, and, and he was a Mary Curie Research Fellow at the Institute of, for Photogometry at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. As um, a member of the CHN, I should also like to highlight that Google Arts and Culture uh, launched an online initiative calling attention to um, hold heritage sites under threat from climate change. Uh, so the Heritage on the Edge series reveal how rising sea levels, coastal erosion, and extreme weather patterns are endangering landmarks across the globe. And one of the sites was uh, part of this project was the site of Kila Kiswani, which is now one of the sites where um, a group of CHN partners is piled co-piloting a project on climate vulnerability index. So I'm really excited to um, be introducing Chance to tell us more on what Heritage on the Edge revealed about culture, heritage and resilience and climate change. Over to you, Chance. Thanks, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks for your kind introduction, Dr. Julep. Um, it's a pleasure to be participating with all of you, with uh, so many professionals and institutions from around the world today to highlight together the key ways culture supports the resilience of people and communities. In case you haven't heard of Google Arts and Culture before, our mission is to make the world's culture accessible to anyone, everywhere, for free. To do this, we collaborate with artists and institutions to promote our shared humanity through interactive and educational storytelling. There are three ideas that sum up our perspective from recent projects. One, we believe storytelling is critical to the climate change discussion. We believe artists have a great role in communicating and visualizing climate data and we believe heritage experts play a crucial role in the strategies for resilience. 
Recent projects have highlighted the use of technology to illustrate the impacts of climate change to heritage sites and worked with artists to interpret and communicate climate change data in interactive and educational ways. With wide ranging partners such as the United Nations, natural history museums and gardens from across the UK, we've launched projects to celebrate the planet and its biodiversity, which I invite you all to explore and share more. Launched in January of 2020, Heritage on the Edge illustrates the impacts of climate change on cultural heritage monuments. It showcases the local chapters of a global story told through local voices in collaboration with the International Council on Monuments and Sites and SciArc and many more. The project's focus was to broaden the conversation of climate change impacts and highlight how technology can document and communicate these challenges to a global audience. It was carried out at five locations in Bagarat in Bangladesh, Kilwakisiwani in Tanzania, Rapa Nui, also known as Easter Island, Chan Chan in Peru, and Edinburgh in Scotland. Not only did it help increase global awareness, but it helped foster new international collaborations between heritage sites through knowledge exchange. We're happy to see some of the heritage locations have already received public and private research funding to continue developing their strategies for resilience, as mentioned before with the CVI. Uh, the 3D data has also been made available as open access for non-commercial research too. The international effort of this collaboration clearly revealed to me that culture and heritage can help build resilience. And this is why Google Arts and Culture is excited about the inclusion of culture in the race to resilience. I'd like to say thank you to our partners who make this work possible. Thank you to the Climate Heritage Network for the invitation to participate in this important moment and event. And thank you for everyone's attention in Glasgow and from around the world. I'll leave you now with a short video about Heritage on the Edge. Thank you. Climate change really is the defining issue of our generation. There's not really been anything like it in the past. If we don't get a handle on it, then we risk losing some of our historic assets that we sort of quite rightly are proud of as a nation. This structure remains uh, surviving for uh, five to six hundred years, but now it's deteriorating faster. That that indicates that there is something change in the climate.
succeed to uh, coordinate different uh, meeting through uh, online webinar zoom uh, where we meet with different people from different parts of the world with different views different ideas ideology on how to uh, protect heritage sites which impacted with the issue of climate uh, changes Next, we have Jordi Pascual, the coordinator of the United Cities and Local Governments Culture Committee. Over to you, Jordi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ewan. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. Delighted to be in this, in this event. The Climate Heritage Network has committed to deliver, to contribute, to become a major partner in the global fight for climate action with this Race to Resilience initiative. Congratulations to the co-chairs of the CHN, the steering committee, the coordinator, Andrew Potts, for this great, great achievement. We, United Cities and Local Governments, we are a founding member of the Climate Heritage Network. We will be enthusiastically contributing to the success of this Race to Resilience initiative with our uh, tools, with our award, the summit we organize, with our database of good practice, with our capacity building uh, programs also asking our members to, to, to influence cultural actors, to make commitments at their uh, local level, and also working with our partners, other networks of cities, and uh, our civil society partners grouped in the global uh, campaign Culture 2030 uh, goal. Um, now I'm going to introduce uh, the, the, the speeches, the presentations of uh, two great partners of UCLG, two great members of the Climate Heritage Network. First, Alison Tikel, the director of Judy's Bicycle, and then Zaid Minti, the initiator, the uh, creator of the Creative City South in Johannesburg. Alison, you have the floor. Thank you, Jordi, um, and thanks everybody for coming. And I'm really, I'm very honored to be part of this very special occasion. Um, I'm very excited about the Race to Resilience. It's a, it's a real achievement of the Climate Heritage Network, uh, and we're, we're raring to go. Um, and all of us here, both online and here, understand that culture has been woefully absent from climate solutions. It's like ripping the soul from, from us. And out on the streets, so many people, so many young people, indigenous communities, are speaking to our collective soul. This is bewildering and a very expensive, costly gap because, of course, artists and creative activists, they mediate our experience, they are intuitive, they are responsive to the reality that we're living in now. And when free to be honest, artists are truth seekers. And today, nothing less is good enough. We need the truth to get beyond the political flourishes, the diplomatic habits of convenience to the hard truth of our current predicament that we've heard so much about today. And we need to call for change, not from our mouths, but from our very souls. Creativity is, by definition, an experience of adaptive learning so crucial to the idea of resilience. Where as things change, we change with those changes and we adapt. Artists and creatives are constantly problem solving. Learning is intuitive, same as scientists, following the scent of a small truth until it resonates with familiarity, with recognition and with relevance. That adaptive mindset is exactly what is needed to disrupt the political mindset, to disrupt the economic mindset, the consumerist mindset, the settled mind of the status quo. The long-term thinking that we're experiencing, even here at COP, 
where we have the 2050 of the UK and Europe. We have the 2060 of China, the, tw China, the 2070 of India, and the long, long, infinite horizon of the United States um, is all about moving what's possible. Millions of people are asking for more. We've heard some of them here. The sooner, the better. Forensics on justice with less cynicism and much less weariness. There's no long term in experiencing the arts and in, in being part of culture. Not even short term, it's immediate. It's immersive. It's who we are in community with an experience and those we share with it. No wonder then that culture, our beliefs, our habits, what we eat, where we play, the film, stories, images matter so much to us. This moves the dial and the long horizons are, need to become intolerable. The arts can help to make it so. So culture can be a trigger, a target for the politics to get on with it. But of course, the long term is not simply a dart to throw at a board, because the very foundations of our current system must change. And we have just got time left to be determining in that change, particularly for societies such as mine, habituated to excessive consumption. We've already been asked today, well, what is enough? That's an incredibly important question. We need to think differently to actually rewire our brains and take responsibility for that. The best barometer of change is not what we think, it's what we do. And neuroscience tells us now that if we repeat patterns of behavior, our brains are plastic, they can change. We can sculpt a different reality and we are all sculptures of our own future. I know this can happen at Julie's Bicycle, my company. Uh, we've been working with hundreds of arts organizations for well over a decade, um, co-creating a different way of doing the work that we do. It's a different way so that the idea of climate action has become a day-to-day -day reality. It's a norm, it's simply how you do it. And that has generated barrels of creativity, infinite energy and ideas that come from a bodily relationship to the climate crisis. This cultural adaptation, so important to the race to resilience, at scale makes it possible to shift the cultural system and thus to contribute to a whole society shift in what we do. And finally, Artists, creative activists don't just make work, they're inter intermediaries. We've already heard again about them. They are stewards of people, sometimes at scale, where you have iconic musicians speaking to millions of lovers at the same time, but more often creative people working at hyper-local levels, sharing processes that are so often about cultural rights, about good stewardship, about creating safe spaces about refuge, about keeping in community, connecting, listening, making, because the creative process itself is comfortable in an open-ended, exploratory space where there are no clear answers. In fact, exploration is the point. And if the ecological crisis is telling us anything, it is that having big technological solutions instead of open-hearted curiosity is quite reckless. We need new cultural ecologies everywhere, building on the knowledge of conversational learning. Julie's Bicycle, my company, has just researched cultural policy all over the world, internationally, and found that with a very few number of exceptions, including places like Argentina, there is almost no read across from cultural policies to the environment, to the climate, to nationally determined contributions. There's almost nothing there. It's a huge gap. Nothing about net zero, nothing about justice, just transition, nothing about nature and regeneration. Today, we're asking cultural ministries all over the world to ensure cultural policy nationally meets the climate crisis head on.
This is why race to resilience is so important. We need to unlock the critical cultural creativity that we need. Because after the trouble, the struggles of so many frontliners, so many scientists, so many cultural heritage activists, the gaslighting, the greenwash in the face of peril and loss, artists, designers, scribes, activists everywhere, and they really are everywhere, will ignite the flame of this moment and then the flame of the next, and then the next, and the next, and the next. Thank you. I'm really excited to be part of this. Andrew, Julie, Ewan, thank you. Greetings all. Uh, thank you, Jody. Dear colleagues, uh, there's good news and there's bad news. The bad news we know already. Our governments have continued to fail us in addressing what's needed to avert climate change year after year. And we have seen the impact of this inaction in the form of droughts, food insecurity, floods, fires, sea level rise, and much, much more. It is, we know, the most vulnerable communities, often in the global south, who are facing deep challenges of inequity, who are the most at risk and also the least able to respond to the demands of climate change mitigation needed at scale. The good news is that yet again, non-state actors have come to the rescue. The Race to Resilience campaign is a welcome evidence-driven response to the need for collaborative action in the face of a global crisis. It provides an opportunity for a broad range of players to commit to and address the crisis by building evidence-based resilience with frontline communities. As a member of the Climate Heritage Network, Creative City South is proud that the network is a partner on the Global Race to Resilience campaign, and that it is able to join hands with colleagues across borders to work on finding proactive solutions that galvanize global citizens, which fire their imaginations and further their capabilities for change. The efforts of the Climate Heritage Network built on over a decade and a half of advocacy for policy frameworks to recognize the potential of culture for addressing the challenges of sustainable development. The work of such pioneers as UCLG Agenda 21 for Culture and the hashtag Culture 2030 goal are just a few of the many who are conscientizing and building on the advocacy efforts of cultural workers and institutions to mobilize culture and change efforts and urgently now in changing minds regarding both what the climate cha challenge is and working to working with people to understand what is needed to address it. The extensive growth in culture-based strategies, specifically aimed at change work, builds on the realization that culture is both a developmental end as well as a process for developmental change. It is a critical feature in communicating the challenges that have to be faced, but also working with the values, beliefs, knowledges of local communities and understanding and addressing these challenges. We cannot change minds with top-down communication campaigns that hope to present the challenges in the mistaken belief that everyone understands the concept similarly. We have to work with how people understand sustainability in their own specific contexts, in their languages, rooted in their value systems and wisdoms. We have to reaffirm their centuries of knowledge of working in harmony with planetary cycles and help them reassert their confidence in their abilities to make the necessary changes happen. We have to recognize that the global emphasis on narrow economic growth is lopsided and damaging. It has made current consumption and production patterns unsustainable, made people captive to unrealistic expectations about what it means to live happily and peacefully with others. Its demands have eroded sensitive local governance systems and even more sensitive natural systems. Culture, we know, plays a key role in the individual's abilities to make meaning in their world. It has the ability to speak to the human spirit and as a result can be a powerful avenue for change processes. As cultural workers, we have seen time and time again that culture-based strategies are powerful in bringing people together, helping them to dialogue, build supportive social networks, enhance social capital, and in that way bring about trust. This is at the heart of building resilience. I remember vividly a moment with colleagues here watching a group of middle-aged and elderly migrant women from diverse Latin American countries living informally in a slum in central Buenos Aires as they performed songs from their respective places, 
not for any goal of becoming performers, but simply as a way of connecting and in so doing build community. This program, part of an upgrade project in the area led by the municipality, was powerful for the deep connection the women attested to have formed by sharing week after week their experiences, hopes and dreams in the processes of working collaboratively in song. These are examples such as these are taking place in communities every day in hundreds of thousands of neighborhoods globally. These projects need to be recognized and tapped into for the experiences they hold, but also the networks they can unlock in place. It is in these communities through their own meaning making processes that advocacy around climate change can come together with cultural awareness and so bring about the resilient change needed. I thank you for the opportunity to address you and wish the race to resilience and the work we plan to do together as the Climate Heritage Network the absolute best. Thank you. Warm greetings to you all from Brussels. My name is Sneska Kvati Mihailovic and I'm the Secretary General of Europa Nostra, the European Voice of Civil Society Committee to Cultural Heritage. And thanks to you all, I have become a very engaged climate heritage activist. Europa Nostra is determined to contribute creatively and effectively to the ever-growing cultural movement for climate action in Europe and globally. And we have therefore proudly and boldly and bravely accepted the challenging task to become the new regional co-chair of the Climate Heritage Network covering Europe and the Commonwealth of Independent States. We are fully aware of the huge responsibility ahead of us. And we look forward to working with all of you to further raise the impact and the outreach of our Climate Heritage Alliance through campaigns and wake up calls like the Race to Resilience campaign, which we are launching today. And now it is my honor and great pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker, Her Royal Highness Princess Dana Firas of Jordan. Princess Dana is president both of ICOMOS Jordan and of the Petra National Trust. She's also a proud and enthusiastic member of our informal network without borders called Women for Heritage, which Europa Nostra launched on the occasion of this year's International Women's Day. And since 2017, Princess Dana acts as UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for Cultural Heritage. This is the much deserved recognition, Dana, of your positive and strong leadership towards putting cultural heritage at the heart of sustainable development and climate action in your country, in your region, and globally. And we look forward to running together with you the race to resilience to promote culture-based solutions for fostering climate resilient regions cities and villages and their communities across the globe. Dear Dana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Schneska, so very much for this introduction, for your enthusiasm and for the incredible work that you do at Europa Nostra and to protect and promote cultural heritage and climate heritage. And I am very proud indeed to join hands with you in this race to resilience. In 2015, the year the world leaders signed the Paris Agreement and committed to the Sustainable Development Goals, I called for the adoption of an 18th goal on culture and heritage. I did so because our experience has shown that any meaningful action for the betterment of human lives and our natural environment requires culture-based strategies. Six years later, at this milestone event, we recognize collectively that culture, heritage, and the arts are integral to sustained, durable, and real action on climate change. Congratulations to all of you, the Climate Heritage Network, and everyone who has worked so hard to get us here. Ladies and gentlemen, climate change and cultural heritage are inextricably linked. Climate change has become the most significant and fastest growing threat to people and their cultural heritage worldwide. Not only does climate change impact physical places and landscapes, but also the relationship that people have to these places and to one another. Time and time again, we witnessed how extreme weather phenomena inflict significant damage to archaeological sites and built structures, along with manuscripts and artifacts contained within them. Wherever we turn, 
we see significant loss and often irreversible damage to cultural heritage as a result of climate-induced fires, winds, droughts, and changes in precipitation, flooding, and extreme temperatures. I worry deeply about the fragility of the sandstone carved monuments of Petra, for example, arguably one of the most important UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And only recently, UNESCO issued a scientific assessment that detailed the role of forests in World Heritage Sites play to mitigate climate change by absorbing 190 million tons of CO2 from the atmosphere each year. But what was alarming was the finding that 10 forests released more carbon than they sequestered because of pressure from human activity and climate change. Climate change also causes damage and loss to intangible cultural heritage. The decline and disappearance of vegetation and plant and animal species alters important cultural practices, traditions, use of medicinal herbs, and most importantly, food security. Climate-induced damage and loss changes people's relationship with each other, with the land, and with the places they identify with. This causes an evolution in the sense of identity and in values, and a loss of traditional stories, rituals, and habits that are no longer set in an identifiable cultural landscape. Ultimately, climate change impacts people's lives, livelihoods, and their way of life, reshaping economies, landscapes, and communities. Equally, without cultural heritage, our efforts to mitigate and survive climate change will not be adequate. We need culture, heritage, and the arts to survive, but also to thrive in spite of climate change. The key to this and why we are here today lies in building resilience, which includes the capacity to transform, the capacity to persist, and the capacity to adapt. Culture, heritage, and the arts are the key to all three components of resilience. Culture-based strategies build on traditional systems of social cohesion and communal strength to enable people to cope with stress and change. They focus on inherited values of trust, social networks, and place attachment, all critical to how communities come together and survive in times of challenge. Culture-based strategies integrate important, but often unrecognized local, traditional, and indigenous knowledge and time-honored technologies, including historical learning through practice and adaptation. They acknowledge resource-based livelihoods, traditional use of the land and sea for subsistence, and sustainable management approaches. The ancient hydrological systems of the Nabataeans, for example, hold invaluable lessons for Jordan and other water poor countries to inform our approaches to water harvesting, collection, distribution, and use. And there is much to be learned from traditional building practices, use of materials, agricultural techniques, and much more. We know now that any successful effort, real actionable change will require global and society-wide transformation implemented at all levels and among all communities. This extensive buy-in can only be achieved when all communities are understood and acknowledged. And when everyone is heard, we move further along the path of equity and justice. Culture-based strategies honor diversity and incorporate unique and differing worldviews and belief systems, related rites and rituals, sacred natural sites, mythologies, spirituality, languages, and values. Culture provides the space for dialogue and exchange, fosters interconnectedness, emphasizes adaptive learning, including the role of creativity and inspiration in adaptation and innovation. We anticipate the need for urgent, rapid, and far-reaching measures. We know that change is difficult, disruptive, and often unfair. Culture embodies within it an intangible quality that remains critical for human well-being. It is a celebration of beauty, of history, of human connection. It defines our national identity and what is important to us. It expresses our national character. And in our collective effort to begin the process of evolution, of transformation in our production and consumption patterns, and our lifestyles, our national character matters. 
It will be the glue that holds together our communities and a necessary reminder that we are doing this for us, all of us, and for generations to come. I am immensely proud to work with the Climate Heritage Network and congratulations once again on the launch of this truly groundbreaking Race to Resilience Culture Initiative. Thank you all very much. Thank you. My name is Gerhard Leitner. I'm the Secretary General of the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, the Global Voice of Libraries, and I have the enormous privilege to introduce our final speaker today. But before, allow me some words to this really very, very important campaign. Resilience requires connections, connections to the past and the lessons that it can teach us but also connections between ourselves, binding us together. Connections enabling us to mobilize, to support each other, to understand others' experiences and values, to create and innovate in the way we face our common challenges. The written and spoken word provides one of the most effective ways we have of realizing these connections. It moves, it informs, it enables actions at all levels. Crucially, it should be available, accessible to everyone, because for culture-based strategies to enable us to build a more resilient world, the need to be inclusive. This is what libraries and my organization, IFLA, as the global voice, look to achieve. A strong and united library field, powering literate, informed, participative, and crucially resilient world. And I can promise you, the millions of libraries in all parts of the world will do their best to support you. There are a few strong examples of the power of words to move to change outlooks, to change behaviors, than poetry. Especially as a librarian, I'm excited and honored to introduce the final performance of today's program by Roseanne Watt. Roseanne is a voice from Scotland, from the island of Shetland. She's a poet, a filmmaker and musician. Her first poetry collection won multiple awards and her work often explores themes of home, land and sense of place. Unfortunately, I'm not able to read her poems in the Shetland language, but I was deeply touched by her poems I read in English. Roseanne, thank you so much for adding your voice to today's program. The floor is yours. Hello. Thank you so much um, for that wonderful introduction and thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. It's a, a wonderful thing to be here. Um, I uh, would like to begin with a poem that uh, I wrote about a fox and when I think of foxes I often think of resilience as they are these wonderful animals that have adapted to survive in urban landscapes. And I wanted to uh, read you a city poem today because uh, of the setting of uh, the conference that we're speaking at. Um, so this is Box. She sat so brazen in the lovely blood of the street lamps. We thought in our old arrogance that we had imagined her there, as if we who dare to call her thief could ever call her likeness into being. Her presence stilled us. She did not look our way, though she could hear the weight of breath in our lungs, the absurd fanfare of our bodies I'm sure we smelled of damage long since done, all oil and smoke and threaded by some distance, something quelled and dormant lingering in our skin. But this night was never about us. We were nothing but a minor intrusion on her evening work. She did not move when we did. Beneath her black gloves, the wet street glistened like an altar. She let us pass, and we stole her image in furtive glances. 
um, there's been a lot of mention of uh, language and especially indigenous language uh, as a way of connecting and uh, articulating the uh, the uh, uh, the climate crisis and um, I I find that uh, my best connection to place and to land is through the local language of Shetland. So I'm going to read you a poem here called Rain Goose, which is uh, a bird that uh, is uh, known for its ability to predict the weather events. And it's my most uh, anthropocentric poem, I think. So this is Rain Goose, and I will read an English translation afterwards. Do surely look down. Shirland, I suppose, a rays of these doomed days. We named it once to lure for that slant or urgent sang at first riven to thy throat. Never leaked, there's water heads at the east. Sang, or silence, they're gathering. You're surely exhausted, singing your prophecies of storms in these downpour days with none who want to listen for that long tear of urgent song that first ripped open your throat. Never heed. Columns of cloud are rising in the east. Song or silence, they gather. I'm going to finish on a poem which I wrote on the theme of hope and resilience, and I uh, wrote it to the future. Um, so this is to those of you who are not yet here. I am writing to you because I hope to find you well. I've been thinking a lot about you lately, in the same way I've been thinking about that word, well, and how every message I write these days begins with this earnest spell. There's something good in it, I think. The way, the way we're saying things we really mean, or at least I seem to believe more in the sincerity of spoken things. But I've always been a sucker for the sweet rot of hope. I carry it in my mouth like toothache or a secret worth keeping. You know this better than anyone, of course. The amount of pins I've stuck in you is much the same experience. Really, I'm writing to you because the other day I wrote this by mistake. I hope you're keeping wells. And it made me think of that other side of meaning, the one with palms cupping water, with stones and coins inside its walls. And I remembered the time I went to visit one just like that, up north, whose name means healing well in our island's dead language. I'd read about it in this folk book, dared myself to believe in it enough to go looking. The story says an old god went to die there, and if you want the water's medicine, well, you better be willing to carry it. What I want to tell you is I found it, and it did not cure me as I hoped it would. It was that last part I'd not truly understood, how I am too the keeper of the well. And this is why I'm writing to you, just to say I hope, wherever you are, this finds you. Thank you. Thank you to Roseanne Watt, and thank you to all our speakers who have joined us today from around the globe to mark this important moment as we launch a culture of resilience, and truly demonstrating that culture connects people across the world. My name is Ewan Hislop. I am the immediate post chair of the Climate Heritage Network, along with my colleague Julie. And today we have seen and heard key ways in which culture supports the resilience of people and communities, including the most vulnerable. The Climate Heritage Network Race to Resilience Partner Initiative is a commitment to gather a global community of local governments, of cultural institutions and others from 200 cities and regions across the world to take culture-based action for resilience and adaptation. It's an ambitious goal by 2030 for over 200 million people from communities and vulnerable groups to be made more resilient to climate risks and impacts. 
as a result of culture-based strategies. The aim of today is to secure expressions of interest to be part of the design and implementation of the Race to Resilience Culture Initiative in 2022. I encourage you to go online to our dedicated sign-up platform where you can find more information and join our mailing list. And that information should be coming on the chat for you now. Importantly, we want you to sign up to express your interest in being part of the Race to Resilience Global Culture Campaign. Thank you for joining us today, wherever you are, and goodbye from Glasgow.